This podcast is a Believe Network and Luciete production. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a recording artist, a very talented individual, um, all the way from Los Angeles, California, by way of Baston, Massachusetts. But she's with us today. She's given us her time. I appreciate it. The one and only Ketty Monroe. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Hey, how are you? How's it going? It's going great. And again, Good. like I said, it's been a, it's been a while since we had an opportunity to catch up. But yeah. you know, I do appreciate you. You know, taking the time out of your very, very busy schedule to come onto the DD podcast and just want to revisit some things to my audience as far as who you are, where you've been, where you're at, and of course, where you're going. So as I, as I talked about in my opening that you, you did grow up outside of Boston. So talk about life growing up in Boston. Oh yeah. So um, originally I'm from the Island of Haiti. Um, both my parents are Haitian. So we migrated to America when I was very, very young. Um, mm -hmm. So we actually lived in the Boston, Massachusetts area, Dorchester specifically, I lived okay. in for, you know, most of my childhood. Then eventually we kind of moved up towards the North shore. I went to high school there, that kind of thing. Um, growing up in Boston, um, it wasn't really much of a culture shock because it's just kind of what I've always known, sort of say. The weather was always kind of, you know, on another level, of course, when it comes to like the winter and all kind of stuff. Compared 100%. to, like, you know, right, right. Compared to island heat and everything. So you have that. Um, I did learn how to speak English um, in America. So, you know, um, growing up in Boston, because it's known to be a very, um, I like to say, college town, you know lots of educators, that kind of thing. Um, it was very fortunate for me to go to some of the best schools um, while living there, um, grammar schools, middle schools, um, high schools, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Did a lot of reading and writing, um, comprehension, that kind of stuff. So yeah, you know, that kind of helped branch me into more of a songwriter. Um, when I first started, I actually started writing books and I started writing like poems and things like that, like fiction, nonfiction stuff, you know, my right. big imagination before I started doing the songwriting. Um, Boston itself um, for music, um, it's very diverse. Um, I just mm -hmm. didn't really see myself really doing much while I was there I mean I did so much while I was there and then I just kind of outgrew it after a while you know I kind of wanted more of a challenge I wanted to be you know where you know artists are known to be when it comes to music like LA or New York and so that's kind of why I ended up leaving uh, about five years ago um, and yeah I, I've just been you know doing my thing ever since so yeah that's awesome. So you say you were writing books and you were writing. Yeah. What guy? What, what kind of drew you into that direction of wanting to explore that avenue of writing? Well, entertainment in general. Um, I've kind of always been a weird kid, <laughs> like most, right? Um, so I want to say because I was constantly watching television and movies and you know reading magazines and pop culture was such a huge upbringing of mine. Um, mm -hmm. you know, coming from an island where you come here and everything is different. The movies are different. The actors are different. The, the mm -hmm. artists are different. Um, it kind of just opened up my eyes more to like a bigger imagination. And so when I was watching like Stephen King films, very young age, unfortunately, um, and you know, um, Wes Craven films and a lot of like Kung Fu films, things like that, you know, it just kind of branched me over to like the writing. So, you know, I started to say, yay. Let me just come up with like little short stories, things like that. Um, I just liked rhyming in general, you know, um, as a kid, Dr. Seuss was one of my favorite, favorite, favorite writers and illustrators. Um, I just loved how he always rhymed and like a lot of his right. like you know, stories are so like animated and stuff. So that was always a huge part of my life as a writer growing up. And then eventually I started, you know, getting into music. Um, you know, doing chorus um, electives, things like that. And then that just kind of got me into songwriting from that point. 
amazing. And you talk about Wes Craven and Stephen King. So you yeah. definitely like the uh, horror stuff. But... Oh, yes, yes. I was a huge horror fanatic when I was younger. Now I'm like, mm -mm. you know, as you get older, I'm like, <laughs> no, you, you, can't, you can't pay me to go to the movies and watch any no. of the films nowadays. No. You, as a kid, here. definitely, definitely. I mean, you know, the thrill, the blood, the gore, all that. I was huge on that, you know, growing no up. No fear, huh? No fear. No fear, no fear. <laughs> no fear. No so fear. <laughs> let's talk about, you know, the musical influences, you know, when you were growing up. So talk about yeah. some of the artists and how did you, like your earliest memories of like discovering music and then who were some of your influences as time was moving forward as you, be, as you were a fan of music growing up? Yeah, well, growing up, I grew up off of a lot of Haitian music. Um, okay. So a lot of Caribbean island music, things like that. You had like the Kiki Loves, the Tropicanas. Um, you had, um, of course, um, a lot of the comedians as well. For me, I personally, when I started to get more into the pop culture in America, I, I was more of like a, a pop star vocalist kind of gal so I grew up you know in the 90s of course so it was for me it was all about the Whitney Houston Celine Dion was huge especially I don't know if you know but in the Haitian community she's like very big and really so, yeah it's it's a thing you know it's it's weird because my aunt <laughs> was the one who put me on to the Titanic films. Mm -hmm. um, so growing up when I used to watch a Titanic because it was such a huge soundtrack, that was what made me gravitate towards, towards Celine Dion. And so it was all about Celine Dion and her big voice. And so growing up, I listened to a lot of Celine Dion and I was, I was really huge on like big vocals, you know? And so like from mm -hmm. her, it was like um, Whitney Houston. Um, then you had like... Um, you, you had a lot of people that I, I grew up listening to. Um, for me, um, once I got into the whole pop star stuff, it was more like the Spice Girls I was listening yeah. to. You know, that was like my my biggest, I want to say that was like my breakthrough when I said, I'm going to do this. I want to be, I want to sing. I want to do this was, you know, watching the Spice Girls growing up. Um, a lot of that. Um, but I, I will definitely say it was definitely Celine Dion and, and Whitney Houston for me. Like that just the voice, the voices, you know. So I, yeah. I guess that Spice World definitely changed your life, I'm assuming. Uh huh. Correct? Spice World was like a whole nother level. I was like, oh no, I'm doing this. Yeah. Girl you know? power. <laughs> Girl power. Exactly. I yeah. love it. I love it. Yeah. So when did it enter your mind? You know, when you said when you with the idea of you becoming a recording artist, when was it? How old were you? And how did you go about doing it? So I had a friend of mine. Um, I'll never forget him. He's actually he's still around, um, of course, in the, the Massachusetts area. His name is Michael. Um, and when we were 13, I want to say 13, 14. Um, he he was always one of those spoiled kids. So his mom actually had um, gotten him like this big computer software at the time. And I don't know if you know, remember Garage Band. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. So we we had he had a Garage Band, and we used to cut like little demos in his room. So nice. we would like he would be like my producer somewhat, and like I would be the vocalist. And now looking back, I'm like, wow, those songs are horrible. But you know what? That was what sparked it. You know, that was my first time, like, in a studio, so to say. Mm -hmm. you know, right. Music, and, you know, knowing how to navigate through the whole software and everything. Uh, <laughs> and um, from there, I was like, yeah. So I want to say about 13, 13 years old. Um, it was actually when I started songwriting the most um, was at 13 years old because, you know, I was trying to figure out what my niche was. I was trying to figure out what mm -hmm. my style was um you know what what gravitated towards me um what I like to write about things like that you know I was it was a it was a very experimental year for me um so I want to say 13 years old for sure and it was the garage band yeah wow it's amazing how just how technology and the advancement of it yeah. and it gives people a more opportunities to explore even more you know, I'm a generation or two ahead of you, and we had we had tape recorder. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you yeah. had to play an instrumental in the background if you wanted to talk about <laughs> singing back then. But mm. now it's like with the Garage Band and like you know Pro Tools and 
all these all these amazing things that are out there now for people to really explore and become the best version of themselves vocally is definitely important. Oh, now, okay. now, did you take voice lessons as you began as you began your journey? Um, so I started taking minor voice lessons in school. So when I was, um, you know, in middle school, um, I, w- I don't want to say they were like one on one voice lessons. They were more like just basic chorus lessons. Um, and then in high school, I was taking more of advanced concert choir classes where you had to audition to be in these groups because we actually were the ones that would do all the performances for all the assemblies and things like that. So right. it wasn't just a regular elective where you can just, you know, sign up when on your transcript and go. I actually mm-hmm. had to audition. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't get my first real professional vocal um, teacher until I was about... Yeah, until like after high school, after like I started doing the independent thing, like after my first album, um, Venus Flytrap, after my first EP, and that's Chris Waller. He mm-hmm. actually trained Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown back in his day. So okay. I was very fortunate to get him. I met him through this talent agency that I was signed to at the time um, that I used to work for. Um, very, very briefly. Um, and he, you know, was one of their people on their roster. So that's kind of how I met him. Um, very pricey, but worth it. Um, and then after I left them, after our contract had ended, um, you know, we just kept in touch and, you know, he would give me one-on-one private lessons. Um, and we know we still keep in touch till this day. Um, and he's a great person. Um, I, I don't know where my, I mean, I was good, you know, but he he took me to a whole nother level, you know, with my diaphragms, my diction, my crescendo, my belting, everything that I can say as a vocalist now when I perform, when I'm singing in a studio, I would I would definitely give Chris Waller my props for sure. Yeah, voice lessons are are super important, yeah. you know, as a vocalist. And even I have it's to a learn great that. investment. I know it it's is. one of those Truly things is. people kind of try to like cut corners around, like, you know, I can always do the auto-tune thing. And yeah, don't get me wrong, you know, especially like you said with this day and age of technology, there's nowadays you don't even have to have the best voice to cut a hit record. But for me, maybe because I'm such an old school, old soul. Right. Um, it's all about the performance, baby. Like, look, I can fool anybody I want on record. You know, I think if that's where the art comes in, it's beautiful. But at the end of the day, what I've learned is my biggest strength and what gravitates me towards more fans is my live performances. You know, I just performed in Oklahoma um, at a baseball game singing the Star Spangled Banner. Now, if I was always you know, an auto-tuned artist that only did, you know, studio sessions, that's not something that I would be able to pull off, you know, and that's why I feel like as a vocal, as a vocalist, if you really take yourself seriously as a singer, invest the money and get a vocal teacher, if that, even if you're the best, look, the best of the best have gotten vocal lessons, Ariana Grande's gotten vocal lessons, Whitney Houston's gotten vocal lessons, Mariah Carey's gotten vocal lessons, no matter how good you are, you're still going to want to get vocal lessons because at the end of the day it's your tool it's your craft and you have to tune it at the end of the day it's Mm -hmm. like you want to you can be a natural good driver you're still going to have to practice practice makes perfect you know Beyonce practices every single day before she goes on tour it's the same thing no matter how good you are at something you still have to put in the work you still have to practice you it's your craft you still have to tune that up and that's why I always tell singers, you really want to take this seriously. Do not half-ass, I hope I can say that. <laughs> Do not <laughs> cut corners with your your craft. It's your voice. That's that's your baby. Take care of it. Yeah. You know, invest in a vocal teacher. Or if you're lucky and you can find one for free, great please do the investment, you know, the breathing techniques, the the pronunciations, all of that matters when it comes to being a singer. Yeah, it's funny because um, as we're recording this on a, on a late Friday evening here on the East Coast, you know, you're on the West Coast at mm-hmm. my regular job, which is um, no one knows where it is. Um, I had a um, I had a volunteer event yesterday and, you know, people found out that I was in the running for America's Next Top Hitmaker. And mm-hmm. they asked me to sing. And I said, oh, because we usually celebrate birthdays. I said, oh, I'll sing yeah. happy birthday. 
And I say that they wanted me to sing on the spot. And I did. And people were like, oh my God, you really can sing. Yeah. And it's all about, and I, and I take it back to my, my vocal coaches that I've worked with in the past. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and I still have my lessons still on my voice app. So all I have to do is just <laughs> play it and just go along and just practice, 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 yeah. practice, practice. And I've gotten so much better at it. And that, that ultimately will help you in the performance aspect of everything. Now, as you're, you know, as you're growing, you know, you're taking, you know, your lessons and that type of thing. Now it's about the presentation. It's about who you are. So yes. how did you come up with, and I know Ketty is your real name, but how did you come up with Ketty Monroe? How did that come to be? So that actually was given to me low key. Um, so in the small hmm. hometown that I went to high school and all that stuff in was Lynn. Lynn, Lynn, the city is saying you never go back the way you came in. Sin City, they like to call it the OG Sin City. And in Sin City, that's where I've cut, you know, all of my original, my original demos, my original mixtapes, everything. And majority of the studios that I worked on were on Monroe Street. Mm hmm which is in downtown Lynn. And that's why it's spelled M-U-N-R-O-E. Now, as I would always go there to record, I started to build a bit of a reputation for myself because people would actually be able to hear me down the street from the window that was open in the studio. Oh. If you were in there or if you were happened to be on the block. And so people started to be like, wow, like who is this girl? Like she's always like, you know, working. And before I knew it, it'd be like, hey, you know, you miss Monroe, right? And I'm like, what? Because <laughs> I would be like, you know, maybe like at a party somewhere or I'm like at the carnival somewhere and people would recognize me just, and they didn't know my name at the time. So they would just literally call me Miss Monroe because that was the only time I ran into them was right on Monroe Street. And right. eventually I had a friend of mine um, way back when, I'm sure he's he's still he's still around. Um, he actually was just like, yo, Ketty, you know, Monroe, you know, Miss Monroe. And then it, it just kind of stuck with me at one point. And I remember my first first performance. Um, it was in Revere Beach and it was like this little beach house, like Baja bar kind of vibe thing. And that was actually how they announced me before I went on stage. I thought they were just going to say, you know, Ketty and whatnot. And they just actually just say, oh, this Ketty Monroe, welcome her to the stage. And I'm just, I just kind of wow. went with it. I was like, okay, cool. You know, and ever since then, people just kind of just kept calling me that. And I didn't knock it because it was, it was a familiar, a familiar name. It was a familiar face. It was just, you know, if, if you just said Ketty, people would be like, huh? And then, you know, if you say Ketty Monroe, they'd be like, oh, okay, I know who you're talking about. You're talking about Homegirl on Monroe Street that's always belting out all these songs like two, three in the morning because our sessions would go for hours. Like we would go right. near midnight and we wouldn't be done till like seven in the morning. That's how I used to do it back then. So yeah, that's kind of how I came about with it. And before I knew it, I was like, okay. <laughs> that's That's amazing amazing yeah. Yeah. now you mentioned one time that you were going to active school and this is before the pandemic so talk about how you kind of steered kind of took a detour and dabbled yeah. in acting a little bit yeah so when I initially moved to LA that was on my my list period I was like I want to get into acting you know because back in high school I did a lot of musical theater and I was I was really good at it mm -hmm. um you know I love the stage I love the singing the acting the drama whatever um, right. so when I got here, I was like, I really want to get into acting. Um, and I mm -hmm. did, I started to, um, attend the, um, Gary Spatz conservatory. It's in, um, Beverly Hills. I got in through an audition. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. So that was awesome. very, very cool. Um, so it was, it was a 300 people, I think at the time. And then it, they narrowed it down to about 20 of us. So I was very, very lucky, very fortunate. Um, mm -hmm. And I started doing that for a while up until the pandemic. And then mm -hmm. once the pandemic started, um, you know, we couldn't be in class physically, but, you know, we had our Zoom sessions, which was a little harder. But then, you know, you learned how to do self tapes. You learned how to do, you know, a lot of um, monologues, you know, one on one with like just visuals. Everything was just like online. And then eventually... 
um, as I started to get more into that, I took some time away to, to learn more stage stuff. So after the pandemic, I went back to acting classes, but instead I, instead of going for like filming television, where I was initially enrolled, I went right. for stage. So I ended up at the young actor studio in North Hollywood. And so I was there for a while, um, you know, mm. learning a lot of Stella Adler, you know, a lot of um, different other methods, things like that, um, which was great for me. And then eventually I just started doing background work because I was like, well, you know, what better way to get more acting experience than to be on set, which was also the same advice that my acting coach at the time had given us. He said, look, if you want to do this for real, the best thing you want to do is to just try to be on set. And so I figured, agreed. Well, you know, what way to make money, um, you know, see it for yourself, learn all the different vocabularies, you know, back to one and take two, you know, all this stuff. So mm -hmm. that also helped build my experience with the acting world. Um, and I, I haven't really been doing much auditions, like in-person auditions. A lot of the stuff I started doing were more like um, self-tapes auditions and things like that, which I got a couple callbacks for. Um, but then unfortunately, you know, I don't know what it is, but sometimes depending on the budgets of the films and the projects, some projects, they're just a no go after a while. Yeah. So even if you put in the work and, and, you know, you, you, you do your part and you do what you're supposed to do it, nothing happens, you know, they just kind of cut it or they scratch it and it's just like a huge waste of time. So I've been really trying my best to, um, take some time away from just doing auditions right off the bat um and I really want to take my time to go back to acting school again just because I really want to hone my craft just a little bit um that way I'll have more of a guidance you know I'll be in a room full of people that know what they're doing you know that can help me also cut corners and not have to run into the same things over and over again I agree yeah, so it's it's a lot of that. It's a hustle in itself, you know, but I will say I've made more money doing acting work out in LA than I have doing music work, but then it started to pick up with the music once I got into syncs. So I had my song placed on like HBO Max, I've had songs placed in Disney Channel. So then it just started to even out. And then before I know it, unfortunately, it did take a little time away from my personal music but I loved you know writing for other people in general so I kind of use that as a leverage to also get more acting gigs as well the fact that I had songs in tv and you know different things like that different avenues so yeah it's a good negotiation tool for sure and then yeah. act, and as an actor myself you know and for the most part like most auditions now are all self-tape mm -hmm. and for me, it's not even a matter of like, all right, if I get something, because I, I still submit for myself, but my agent, he'll submit me for a lot of things as well, for a lot of bigger, like big, big stuff that obviously that an agent or a talent manager will be able to get for you versus, you know, you doing it yourself. They have a leeway of getting into those rooms and being able to get you or pitch you and say, hey, I think my, my client will be really, really good and really suited for this particular role, you know, and cast it and hopefully cast it for it. But you, you brought it up. And and I was listening to it earlier. It was your debut uh, EP, I believe it was 2017, The Venus Flytrap. And yeah. I got to tell you, yeah. it reminded me of Lady Gaga's The Fame album, her debut <laughs> really? album. Really? You know, it's so you funny. I was listening a lot to that album around that era. I was so really. Sick. Yeah, especially in high school. I was, oh my God, I stand her. Like, <laughs> the fame fam i love i love is. that album it was uh i will say had a, a, a slight bit of an influence on it it kind of gave me um but for the album itself when i was working on it it was it was more of a fusion it was more like a little um r b meets pop if that makes right. sense it was very different from what i was doing um you know, at the time in Boston and, you know, a lot of people, when I used to go out and do those songs, they, yeah, there was, they, they really liked those songs, man. I was actually listening to it while I was working out today. Well, I didn't listen to that particular album. I was listening to my other stuff and I was scrolling down and I noticed I had that and I was like, wow, you know, I, it's, it's been a while. Um, you know, my writing has definitely gotten better. My vocals have gotten better. Um, but it's it's definitely a classic. It's one of those. I got to get a vinyl for that or something. 
you should maybe she do some giveaways and that type of thing yeah you know and some finals yeah so so when you were putting this project together and when you were able to pick and choose which songs were going to make was was going to make the cut what went into the whole entire thing? What team did you, you know, who was your team, you know, from a production standpoint and how you were able to put it all together? That's the crazy part. It was really not much team to that. Um, it was basically, so me, I, I wrote all the songs on it. The engineer mm-hmm. producer, I would say engineer, um, that was Fernando uh, La Serena Records, um, great guy from Chile. Um, I worked with him on majority of my earlier stuff in my career. So we mm-hmm. worked on Indigo. We worked on Venus Flytrap. Um, we also worked on a couple singles like um, Let Go. Um, we also worked on, yeah, I want to say just about that. Um, the beats itself, the producer, um, he actually goes by Dino. Um, he's actually in New York. Um, I believe he's from Shanghai, uh, China. Okay. At the time, I met him via online um, way back in 2015, actually. Mm. Um, that's actually when the song's starting to get put together. I didn't release it until 2017 because, um, unfortunately, at the time, the studio that I was working out of got broken into. And all of the stuff, and not just me, not just my music, but every artist that was you know, part of that studio that worked in that studio, everything was gone. Oh my God. I actually had to start over from scratch. So this, the album itself should have came out about a year later. I want to say 2016, late 2015. But because of that dilemma, unfortunately actually didn't end up coming out. Start over. Because I had to rewrite everything, re re sing everything, redo everything. Luckily, you know, the contracts that Dino and I had were exclusives. So it wasn't like I really missed out. You know, he was always able to resend me the stems, things like that. Um, mm-hmm. But it was a lot of work just down the drain. And, you know, unfortunately, there were artists who just couldn't get anything back. You know, they just couldn't mm-hmm. afford to do everything over again. It's terrible. Yeah. So that was that. So, you know, when I think of Venus Flytrap, it, it it really says, wow, like a lot has happened during this era. And, you know, it really makes me appreciate the little things, you know, it makes me appreciate just that small team. It, it was just really three people, me, right. the engineer and the producer, you know, I didn't have any PR work. I didn't have a manager. I still don't have any major labels behind me, anything. Everything I do is independent, which is kind of why you know, things take time for me to release because I'm the one writing my songs. I'm the one coming up with the concepts, the ideas, the videographer, the photographer, the artwork, I'm doing everything. And then, you know, if I'm lucky, I can hire an engineer, I can hire a producer to do everything else. But at the end of the day, you know, they don't have to push it if they don't want to. You know, they right. don't have to market it if they don't want to. That's all of me. And so sometimes, you know, my numbers look a little crazy. But at the end of the day, when I go out and I do these shows and, you know, people gravitate towards that, that's what makes me keep doing it. Because I don't look at the idea of, well, well, I don't have a million views. So what's the point? It's like, so what? You just keep going, you know? You do it for you, right? I do it for me. And people, once they get to know me, excuse me, as an artist, they'll hear the act, they'll hear the story, the idea behind the fact that, I didn't have a machine. I didn't have a team. You know, I wasn't discovered off YouTube. I didn't have someone, you know, we didn't have the TikToks and all these major social medias. like. So you got to understand the, I, you know, try to put myself, try to put yourself in my shoes for a second. You know, Mm -hmm. Island Girl learned how to speak and write English in this country, wrote all these songs by herself without nobody without anyone without any money behind her I was a maid barista you know catering every job I can think of I was doing I was doing and putting that money back into my art most people will respect that and at the end of the day that's kind of what I'm aiming towards versus like okay well this is popping she's popular you know she's twerking she's doing whatever it is that's cool but you know that just that stuff only lasts for a season flash um, in the pan flash in the pan yeah 15 I'm aiming minutes for of fame timeless, out of there 
right you know aiming for timeless and what i what i hope gravitates people not only just you know the songs themselves but the stories behind the songs right how they became because that's what gravitates me towards my favorite artists nowadays mm -hmm. you know a lot of my favorite artists nowadays it's not just because i like their music it's because i like their story i like how they became who they are you know how they were discovered you know what you know memories that they've gotten behind these that's personally that's my niche you know anyone can build a pop artist tomorrow and For sure you know, you know you got too many industry plans not to knock them don't get me wrong a lot of them are pretty good but i'm just not really a fan of the industry plant thing call me a hater whatever it's Man. just most and you know most indie artists don't like industry plants let's talk about it for real we don't we don't because how dare you just pop up six months and we've been doing this for 10 years. A lot of us don't like y'all and it's, and it's nothing personal. It's just, we don't, it's not fair, you know, because majority of them don't even deserve to be where they are. Don't even earn that. But you know, someone likes the way they look. Someone likes their mother or their father. They might have some weird connection and there you go. They pop. And then you got us who just in the background, like, okay, I'll wait another decade. But it'll be all it'll definitely be all worth it for it'll sure. It'll be all worth it, you know, and it'll last longer. And I think that's where it comes down to it. And I think that's why I don't I'm a firm believer that God didn't put anything in you just just so you can think about it, you know. Like I agree. I'm a firm believer that if there's a dream in you, it's in you for a reason, you know. And yeah. it may not be your season to reap your benefits, but you will have the fruits of your labor. Yeah. And, and I have that mindset every day, regardless yeah. if it's this podcast, my music, my acting, and even my involvement in pro wrestling, like that's my goal is to get there and we're all going to get there. And it's just a matter of putting in the work every single day, yeah. you go to bed and you wake up every day and have this on your mind, not so much as a, you know, not as a bad thing, but really focusing on it because you're passionate about it and you care and you want to, yeah. and you want to take it to the next level. Oh yeah. Well, passion is, is a whole nother level. I was homeless when I wrote Venus Flytrap. Wow. You know, I was in the library. I remember uploading the songs on my, my distro, you know, like, you know, I was homeless, like putting these songs out. And these are the same songs that got me out of the small hometown that I am and brought me to a big city like L.A. And so I'm always going to have a special place in my heart for that stuff, regardless of whether the world hears it or not. I know what those songs did for me. Right. You know? Agreed. There's people who their mom and dad had money. They they always had a silver spoon in their mouth and now they just want a bigger platform to sit on. All right, cool. Good for you. But there's folks who literally went hungry doing this. I'm one of those people, you know, I, I remember sleeping in my friend's cars, you know, people letting me stay on their couches. I mean, luckily I was still working my jobs. You know, I still had two, three jobs. I was living out of a suitcase, you know, I, I was, I was sleeping outside sometimes, you know, in the cold, like, yeah, I've never actually really shared that with mo a lot of people. Not a lot of people know that, but that was that was what my the passion and that drive was doing for me is and regardless right. of whether or not I knew where my next meal was coming, where my where I was couch surfing next, all I I had this dream inside of me. I had this light in me that was like, I'm not gonna put this out just because I'm in a messed up situation right now. And I could have been a criminal, I could have been out doing whatever, but I was like, look, you know, this is who I am. And if this is what I have to go through in order for me to make this happen, then I will. Well, yeah. thank you for sure. Well, number one, thank you for sharing that, yeah. you know, that personal story. And like I said, you know, it's, it's really all about the destination. We already know yeah. true, but it's really truly about the journey getting yeah. to that destination. Mm -hmm. Now talking about, you know, your, your catalog. And again, I've known about your catalog for a while, but I just had to do a little bit more research. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, the different genres that you experimented with throughout. And I mean, we're looking at songs like Indigo, <laughs> yeah. La Vie, and we're looking at Situation, Let Go, yeah. Perfect, Anonymous, Ghosted Me. And the Ghosted Me was like really cool because it was like kind of, it was no instrumentation in the beginning. You know what I mean? Yeah, just so, acapella. Yeah. For acapella. So talk about 
how you were able to experiment with genres because you know a lot of times you know people want to pigeonhole you you know what i mean oh yeah like getting oh, into this and I, that I so it. and but but doing it the opposite way that you were doing it in regards to i'm going to toy with this mm-hmm. i have, i'm do afro beats i'm going to do a little bit of hip-hop a little bit of pop and yeah. go and doing all these things how were you able to compartmentalize that and say hey i'm going to do it this way because that's what's going to work for Ketty monroe and that's mm-hmm. it how were you able to do that I will say that's the difference between me and most artists. And Mm -hmm. at first, that was the one thing that majority of people that I would try to work for, that was their no. The fact that people would normally say, well, we really want to do this. We really want to help you, but we just don't know where to put you, blah, 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 blah. And that's the point. Um, I was tired of being put in a box. I was just tired, especially as a woman of color it's constantly oh you're either r&b or your soul or your and it's like says who you know right. um me i looked at it as moods personality and roles okay mm-hmm. as an actor the best actors don't just stick to one stroke they don't Agreed. just stick to one type of role okay mm-hmm. if you're good at playing the mean girl Okay, cool. Be good at playing the mean girl. But it doesn't mean you can't play the mental patient. Doesn't mean you can't play the psycho. Doesn't mean you can't play the serial killer. And for me, I was able to master having a familiar voice, a familiar sound, a familiar style within different genres. Mm -hmm. That is who Ketty Monroe is. That's what makes me different. And I've, I've learned to accept that. It was a problem at first. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I used to fight managers and, and, you know, playlisters, teeth and nails, like, well, you know, if you're going to do this, you should stick to this. And I'm like, why? Says who? Music doesn't have rules. Okay. I don't, as an, as an artist, I feel like anything you do in the arts, it shouldn't have, they shouldn't have rules. That's what makes them art. You know, like it's like it's like imagine telling Picasso how he should how he should paint a house like or how he should do this. It's like he he's an artist, like right. let him do what artists do, experiment, explore. And for me, I've always been good at that. And once I've learned because we're people, we have different moods, we have different feelings If I listen to someone's playlist, type nine times out of 10, they're going to have 10 different genres on it. Agreed. Human. So why not be an artist that can also play with 10 different genres as well? Why not? Bingo. And that's what a lot of people do. And a lot of people don't understand that because you're looking at somebody that when people see me, they automatically think, oh, R&B. They think about Ruben Stutter and they think about all the, and no, and this is no disrespect to any of those guys because they clearly have been uber successful in, in that realm and what they do. But for me, I can't just accept and just be okay with just being one specific thing because I get bored very, very easily. I need to go outside of that box. I've done EDM. You know what I mean? My first record was 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 an r b record but my second record was edm my last record that i just put out a year ago was reggaeton with with <laughs> and, and and it was a, it was in english and in spanish that i wrote the problem wow. shout out to angie stars who was also on the record with me i'm working and i'm going back to edm now I'm working on a, i'm working on another record yeah. with a guy named blank ages shout out to blank ages and also from another guy not from here i'm working on a record with him but i refuse you know what I mean? I would rather be independent for the rest of my career than have someone tell me, Derek, you you're only you're we want you here. And I'm just like, I can't accept that because that's yeah. not me as an artist. I yeah. want to be able to have my wings and do wherever I want to go. You know what I mean? So I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. And and I and again, it at first I was going to I almost threw in the towel, don't get me wrong, because I was like, well, maybe, you know maybe they're right. Like, maybe I should just stick to one thing, but mm-hmm. in my, bl- I, my soul would not allow me. It was like, look, girl, right. I love rock. 
I love pop. I love R&B. I love music, period. And what better way to express your love for music than to also, you know, pay homage to it in, in some way through your right. music. And especially coming from the islands, it's like, you know, we're very versatile in general, you know, and, and, and again, there's very, very little artists who can pull that off. And I feel like to really be like dope, you got to be able to pull that off. It's cute. And I like the idea that some artists stick to their thing. That's great. But to me, like Rihanna, honey, like think about that for a second. The fact that this woman can go from EDM to house. And then when you think of her earlier records, like Pondered Replay, if it's something that you want, these are island Afro based beats. Then you have her R&B era. Then you have, mm -hmm. her, you know what I'm saying? Like, not a lot of artists can do that. And for me, I feel like if you're going to be dope, if you're going to be really, really good, you got to be able to pull that off. It's just like in the acting world, like you can stick to the same stroke if you want, if you're good at that, if it's comfortable for you, but challenge yourself. Right. See what you can do, you know, step outside your box. Like it's cool that you have that home. You know, this is a genre you came off of, you blew up mm -hmm. off of great but experiment a little bit, you know? Everybody experiments, you know? Everyone collabs. Collaborate with yourself, if that makes sense. Collaborate mm -hmm. with yourself. Collaborate with the different personalities in your brain. Collaborate with the different emotions, the different moods that you have in your Holy Spirit, okay? Collaborate with yourself. See what you're good at. See what you're not good at. See what moves you. You'd be surprised. You, you'll surprise yourself. I surprised myself in so many ways. Like, as I started really doing this, I was like, wow, I didn't realize I really like this kind of, I, I like the sound. I didn't realize I like this genre. You know, I, I didn't realize I was really good at this. Experiment with your vocals. Mm -hmm. Experiment with your words. There's no right or wrong when it comes to experimenting with genres. And I I respect artists and I like artists more that know how to do that and know how to do it very well. And yeah, not and I, hard, you know? Right, I, and I gotta tell you, um, I'm sure you've seen on my social media and things like that, my favorite artist of all time is Madonna. And yeah. <laughs> the one, well, of the many things that I, I love about her is her ability to give you something different Every single time, every yeah. single album is something different. And she is like, it's an, it's an evolution of an artist. And that forces me because I my, I write just the way I write. And that's just me. What, the way I write and enunciate my words, it's like, I like the way that she does it. Mm -hmm. And not copying, but just more or less paying homage. And I have a blue, it's like a, there's a blueprint that's there. And I think it works for me. But to do something completely different. Like the, for example, the MDNA album that came out in 2012, that was for the most part an EDM album because she was working with Benny Benassi. She was working with Paul Oakenfold. She was working with the Vici, you know what right. I mean? So she was working with these EDM powerhouses. And I mean, my God, every time I listen to that album, it's just so energetic because of the fact, and when you hear her vocals going up against that. Yeah. And someone that has been out, since the 80s and is still evolving with the times it with as far as the music business is concerned i love that you know mm -hmm. what i mean so it's all about how you're able to stay with the times and, and stay out that box at the same token that's what i, I love 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 about mm -hmm. what she does but then also with you you have that same mindset of i'm going to do what's best for ketty and what's best for ketty is staying outside of the box and working on it and challenging yourself. That's important. I like to stay outside the box. I just do. I'm I'm not, I don't fit the mold and I like that. I'm very comfortable in my skin. I'm very comfortable in my brand, who I am. I'm not trying to be like the rest of them. I'm not, trust me. Um, and nothing against it. That's just not my cup of tea, you know, in you know, I have a big voice. I can do so much with my talent. So I can't help that I have that ability to not just stick to one thing, you mm -hmm. know? If I could, I would, but I can't. Even if I tried, my 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 brain's going to be like, what are you doing? Like, you know? So yeah, that's just it. Like, 
I'm let me not actually... sorry. <laughs> no, no, and, and it's cool. It's cool. Yeah. But I do have a question for you. Yeah. What's the proudest thing you've done in your career? Hmm. Wow. There's been a few things. Um, the proudest thing I've done in my career. I would have to say, hmm. Wow. There's a there's a few things. I'm gonna say the the one thing that was probably the proudest to me. I would have to say like my major, my major Disney placement. That was pretty cool. Mm, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. But then I got charted in France for the first time. So that was also pretty Really? Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was actually my Indigo. Thank you. That was my Indigo album um, for the song Automatic. Yeah. There's been a few things that were kind of cool because I've never even been to Paris yet. So I'm like, huh? but um, <laughs> that was cool. Um, hmm. But yeah, the Disney thing, I want to say that was like top tier for me because I I'm a huge Disney you know fan and I've always wanted mm-hmm. to be on Disney Channel as a kid in general so the fact that my music was playing on one of the shows there was like right so that was amazing yeah that's awesome that's awesome you told me one time that you had dabbled in with directing music videos yes let's yes. talk about that for a second because yeah. I dabbled in it too, but not to the not to the extreme that you did. So talk yeah. about your experience in directing your own music video, because I can only imagine you have the idea of what it is because you're writing it. I can only imagine when you're writing yeah. music, you're also envisioning a music video that's going along with it. Am I am I safe to say is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Um, unfortunately, I wish that I had the budget for a lot of the ideas that I have for the music <laughs> videos in my head. Yeah. Because, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> hey. Right, 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 right. What I could do with what I have. Um, yeah, a lot of times, actually, it was my Noel Christmas single. I did, I actually um, cut and edited that video as well. Uh, I edited my sanctuary video. It was already edited, but I added the effects and I did all of that kind of stuff. My stay video was cut, edited, and affected by me. Um, another one of my videos that I did myself um, recently, if I'm not mistaken, was also anonymous as well. Um, but yeah, um, they say that when you want something done right, sometimes the best thing to do is to do it yourself. And it kind of got to the point in my career where I was just waiting on people, you know, for just the bare minimum. And it wasn't that I I never had the idea to edit my own videos. It got to the point where I had no choice because I was working with a lot of people that just thought my time didn't matter. You know, you know, they got paid or or they would have like, you know, their upfront advanced or whatever before they got their finalized payment, things like that. Then they just start taking their sweet time. Although they have, you know, deadlines, they have contracts. That was a lot of what I was running into, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And so DIY was trending heavy at the time. I don't know if you remember, it was such a huge hashtag. DIY, oh, yeah. do, it do it yourself. yourself. Yeah. And you know, it was, it, I just love how it was trending right at the time I needed it because I really, in COVID too, COVID played a huge part on that because during COVID, I, you couldn't really do anything. You couldn't just, people no. didn't want to be around you. You know, you can't just mm-hmm. go out and we had the curfew thing going on. It was a mess. So COVID and DIY was what made me really start to hone into just editing my own videos and then as I started to do that I started like this this is cool this is why I'm so big on go out there and and figure out what it is that you do dabble in things that you've never done before because you never know what you what you like to do you never know what you're good at because I never knew I was good at or liked you know editing videos and and you know adding lyrics or adding effects and things like that it's hard don't get me wrong and I still hire a videographer if I could but sometimes, especially as an independent artist, you know, you spend all the money in the studio, you spend all the money marketing. And then when it comes to get the video and everything done, it's like, you know, your budget can be a little tight. So that also yeah. played a huge part in it. And it was like, well, you know, if you're if you're going to cut corners, cut corners on 
other things. Don't cut corners on the marketing and don't cut corners on the product itself. But I think you can cut corners on the visuals. I've seen visuals that were just like, huh? But the songs blow up, you know, the marketing did great. You know, people shoot with their phones nowadays. You're shooting in your backyard. It really comes down to how you cut, do things, how you edit things, how you deliver things. And so mm -hmm. that was the one thing I kind of cheated on a little bit. I was like, you know what, if I'm going to cut corners, I'm going to do it on this because the song is popular, whatever, you know? Right. So that kind of, that's kind of what helped me hone into it. As far as my imagination goes, when it comes to this kind of stuff, sometimes it's literally what I just hear in a song every time I play it. One of my biggest things I like to do is work out or like do something active with the song while I'm doing it. And then that's where like all of my ideas come in to mm -hmm. what I want to do when it comes to the visuals. So even if I do hire a videographer, I'm still going to be able to let them know like, hey, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I kind of want to do could you make this happen? And if they can't make it happen, or if it's something that, you know, might take them an arm and a leg, then I'll just step in and I'll do it myself. I've had people send me what they got and then I add to it and then, you know, or I'll do it from scratch, you know, whatever works, you know, that's just how I have, I've came to that part. I can yeah. still remember when I was stuck and this was during the pandemic because initially I was going to, film every second make it count in new york city we mm -hmm. were going to do a i don't want to say a spoof we we're going to do kind of a, a remake of the movie taken with leon neeson and oh, where wow. the, yeah we were going to do that and we we're going to have actors actresses and they were going to do this big big fight scene you know what i mean and it was going to be a lot of fun and because my videographer had moved to vancouver british columbia but he was going to fly back to new york so we could mm -hmm. you know spend a couple days film this thing, put the baby yeah. to bed, and then we're going to, you know, promote it. But unfortunately, the pandemic happened. The country's got, you know, he couldn't enter the country and vice oh, versa. Yeah. And we were trying to figure out what we wanted to do. Now, initially, we were, I was, it was just going to be me in front of a, a green screen and singing the song, but then we're going to get images of what was going on in the world, which was COVID. All the, the whole entire, like, think about it, when Times Square was shut down that was scary when mm. the eiffel tower was when there was nobody around the eiffel tower when there was no one in vegas on the streets you know what i mean like when the streets were just completely ghost town we're gonna do that but then of course when the george floyd murder happened and i fell into a very very deep depression about it because i'm just like i was literally scared because i'm like oh boy i looked the part too and yeah. and I was and me and my the director were like we gotta we gotta we gotta talk about this. I said so instead of the images of COVID, we could talk about how how could we stop all of these things from happening? You know, police brutality and all those type of things of mm -hmm. unarmed people that look like me. So mm -hmm. we did that, and that's how we were. So I had to shoot on my iPhone. I shot it here, and. Oh. Yeah, I did. It took me, I did it over two days because I really wanted to take my time and make sure we were doing it right. And I just shut, you know, filmed it, put it in the folder, and I sent it to the videographer. And he was like, all right, cool. Everything came out smooth. Now let me get to work. And I was able to obtain images, videos from Getty images and that type of stuff that came out of the budget, <laughs> you know, but it, it, I did what I had to do. And that became the, the music video. And people were asking me, well, you know, did you go to Hollywood to do that? Or did you go I'm like, no, I filmed that puppy in my house mm. and they couldn't believe it. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So just like you said, you know, putting, you know, the budget into other things and as far as cutting corners and, and I don't, I mean, it's not fair to say cut corners. I think I think it's more or less just being smart about it. You yeah. know what I mean? Being yeah. smart about it as far as saying, Hey, I can put these resources here. And I can also utilize my strengths in this area where it may not have to cost as much. You know what I mean? So I think it's really being smart about it while you're in the independent game. And yeah. that was going to be my next question is being signed versus being independent. What's your thoughts on the balancing of that? Because of course, when you're signed, 
everything is given to you. Obviously, your advance is given to you. And then there's your marketing is, that's already taken care of. All these other things. But on the but your freedom in regards to your creativity may not be as free as it would as you were independent. But then, of course, when you're independent, then you really have to depend on you. What's your opinion on both sides? Um, I think it depends on the artist's situation. I've never been signed, period. So I can't speak for every artist. But on the business aspect, because I am in business school and I understand how these things work, all a label really is, is a bank and resources. Two things. Mm -hmm. That's it. They have all the resources you need. It's like basically having a person that can here's a velvet rope, skip the line. You know, you don't have right. to do all the elbow work. You don't have to, you know, shake hands with everybody. You don't have to, basically they do all the work for you. Okay. Um, on the flip side, they do own your masters, you know, um, it depends, again, it, it depends on the situation. You know, there's the record deal and then there's a distribution deal. We can get into that. Right. So the record deal, which is a traditional, I sign, blah, 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 that kind of thing. That's where an, a label comes in. They own basically everything. They own you as a brand. They own your music. They own your masters. They own everything. All you're really doing is dressing up and showing up. That's it. Showing up where they want you to show up, doing what they want you to do, um, making the money. The advances and all of that stuff people don't understand is just a loan. Um, it's not your money. It's your money, but it's not your money. So basically what I mean by that is when they give you these, these advances, it's money that they're expecting to get back plus interest. Mm -hmm. That means if they give you, let's say, a million dollar advance, which is a lot, okay? That means they're expecting to make at least five to six million dollars off of you. And that's including what they own you. Now, that money that they're giving you, that is studio time, that is travel, that's marketing. A lot of artists don't realize that money itself is for what they're putting into your projects. So you're not going right. to go and spend it on chains and cars, which we've seen other artists do in the past. And we know oh, yeah. how they do, unfortunately. But that's what those advancements are. It's not money to buy your mom a house. Sorry, mom, you're going to have to wait. Okay. Um, that's money for you to put back into the project. That is a loan. Okay. That's what these record deals do. They give you money. It's a loan. They want it back. You do what you're told and that's it. Okay. Um, distribution deals are different because you own your masters you own all of your stuff the only difference is they get a small percentage because they're helping you market yourself right and most distribution deals don't come around unless they see that you can do those numbers because nowadays it's not like back in the day where a, a label will just sign people because they think they have potential they want to see that you can actually make make it happen they make want money, right they want the numbers they want to see you doing shows that way they're not just wasting their time they're not wasting their money they're happy to give you a distribution deal because if they can see that you can do at least something by yourself imagine what you can do when they have when you have multi-million dollar contracts behind you the machine right the machine right because that's really what most of us need is a machine but what an a label needs is to know that if they put a machine behind you, that it's not just going to just look good and not make anything happen. Um, which if you've noticed in the past, that's kind of what's been happening with a lot of, you know, artists is that don't understand the business. They'll sign these deals, not realizing that those advances are loans or not realizing that the machine that is pushing their brand is is pushing it so that they can make the money to bring back not so that they can build their clout clout and fame and all that are two different things you know you can always have clout you can always go viral but at the end of the day if they book out a stadium in Greece and you can't sell those seats you are in trouble my friend you know it's just kind of how it goes it's it's a business agreement Independent artists, they have the full creativity control. They have the control over when to release their music, how to release the music, why to release their music. They basically have control over everything. 
However, the downfall, which is what I struggle with, is that they don't have the machine. They don't have the team to push them. Some of them are very fortunate where they can, you know, they have the resources and they have the money, aka what a label is, resources and money. Money. A lot of artists like to still claim that they're independent when they have distribution deals. And to me, I, I respect it. I get it. You're independent to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. If you still have Universal behind you, helping you push, honey, you are no longer independent. Kill me, okay? I know, I hear it all the time. Oh, well, they're independent because they own their stuff. They own their catalog. But the, the, to a certain extent, yeah, but... There's a contract sign. There's, and there's a, a contract, distribution right. deal. Right. You still have somebody with a lot of backup to push you. You are no longer independent, but you're not a puppet either. And that's okay. You know? Um, And I know sometimes they'll try to take it personally because they're like, well, I'm independent, but, 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 and it's like, okay, but universal music is behind you. My friend, you, you got a Deezer interview because universal is behind you. You're on this because universal is behind you. You're lucky. There are artists who could still make those moves and be completely independent but those they don't come around and chances are when that happens it's because it's in the works you are speaking to somebody you you have an a and r that you're in contact with that is making things happen behind the scene because you are a potential clientele right it, it, it's like it's kind of like testing the waters like when you have an, a very independent artist who doesn't have any ties to anybody industry related but they can still get indoors that's because chances are there's somebody who's on the inside i like to call like a gatekeeper who is giving them that yes who's who's initiating them who's basically saying like okay this person has potential so i'm gonna help them get into certain doors so that i can see what they can do so eventually they will also get there too so they're not going to be independent for long they're not that's my take on it you know it's a it's a Again, it depends on what you want. It depends on the artist. It depends on what your goal is. You know, everybody wants a traditional, just sign me, sign me, sign me. Majority of them end up sorry later. But if you're smart, you'll want what I want, which is a distribution deal. That's my goal. Same here. Same here. You know, you you want the distribution deal because you want to own your copyrights. You want to own your masters. You want to own your stuff. So that God forbid you guys cut ties, you can still go off and you still have your brand, your merchandising, your logo, all of that. But at the end of the day, it does help when you have, you know, major labels behind you that are helping push you. You know, you also want that. I'm not knocking the traditional record deal, but again, I've heard too many horror stories about that. It's not the same as it used to be back in the day. Now with the day and age of social media, it's so easy to get in front of anybody. Most people are not signing those deals. At least people with the brain are not signing those deals. (laughs) Majority of people are aiming for distribution deals, which is the smart route to go as an independent artist because you're keeping your independence, but you're also working. So it's working with versus working for. for. Signing a record deal, you're working for. When you're signing a distribution deal, you're working with. That's the difference. And that was a lesson in the music industry on the DLU podcast by Katie Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> As we as we get into, as we get to um to wrap up here, you know, obviously, you know, we've talked about everything regarding what you're doing, yeah. career wise. You know, we talked a little bit about the music business. I think it's important as far as education and understanding, you know, yeah. what it takes, you know, to make it. But what motivates you to be great? God. Okay. And what motivates me is all the lows. The, the the heavy times, the dark times I've been through, because I don't want to go back there. Um, God and the bad times, two of my biggest motivations. I think of God because I think of the future. I think of the present. Present is a gift, you know. Mm-hmm. I think of my livelihood, my well being, um, my talents, all my attributes. Without Him, I would be nothing. 
That's my first and most important motivation. My second motivation is when I look back and I see how far I've came and I see how much I've grown. I've seen who I became. I've seen all the trials and tribulations that I've been through. Mm -hmm. That's my second motivation because not only do I not want to go back there, but I want to continue to be better than the person that I used to be. I am my own and biggest competition. So I look at myself in the mirror every day and I say, okay, I can do better than yesterday. And then I just go out there and be great. Evolution. That's what it's all about. Right. Now, besides music and besides, you know, the working really hard, what are some of your hobbies? And, and as far as as yeah. how does Ketty have fun? I am. I love to be active. I love to hike. I like Pilates. I like to go to the gym. Um, you know, from time to time, my girlfriend and I, you know, we'll have brunch, the usual, um, the beach kind of stuff. I love to travel. Travel is like my main thing right now. I really, I, I took, I've taken about three trips so far this year and oh, I'm wow. trying to get as much as I can, you know, travel as much as you can while you're young, you know, while you, mm -hmm. you don't have kids, while you're, you're healthy, you know, while you're just here, you know? And so that's my main thing, travel, fitness, um, I love the arts, movies in general. You know, I try to watch every Academy Award winning or Academy Award nominated film that they have out. Um, I'm really big on the streaming. So like I like any Academy Award um, nominated TV shows, things like that, because as an actress as well, I always want to, you know, get into like whatever's popping, whatever's trending. So I'm constantly, you know, watching television, um, not TV itself, but you know, what's, what's trending at the moment, movies, um, again, fitness, travel, food. I'm a huge foodie. I love food. I love cuisines. I love catering, um, you know, top notch food, good quality food, you know, caviar and escargot and, and, and a uh, flemion and all that stuff is like, I love food, food, food. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, basically it i guess i'm basic right <laughs> nothing that, basic about that you know. not believe me, not believe most, me on I mean, come on yes most importantly um i love to go to church i love to worship um i love to pray as much as i can throughout the day meditate i mostly pray um church 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 go to church man you know everything i need i i just go right to church i ask god i speak to god every day i speak to the holy spirit you know um that's because again, my day does not end or begin without God. And so I, everything I do, I try to put God forward because he's, he's, he's brought me out of the fire. He's, he's put me places. I never thought I could be. He's opened doors for me. I never thought I can ever open. And it's like, why not? You know, but that's my favorite thing to do is worship. Praise God. Awesome. Yeah. Amen to that. And yeah. I know you and I were at the same place about a year and a half ago in LA we yeah. were at SoFi Stadium at WrestleMania 39. Yeah. You're that a wrestling was so fan. Cool. I'm a huge wrestling fan. Yes. That was the one thing I, I just I remembered you and I have so much in common about is like yeah. freaking wrestling fanatics, man. I'm a huge wrestling fan. I saw Bianca Belair whoop, whoop, retain her women's champion. Um, who else was there that day? It was, it was cool. Oh, Edge. Oh my God. I saw Edge. I was really excited about Edge. He had the, one of the coolest entrances that weekend when he came out to, um, South of Heaven by Slayer. That was pretty oh cool. For the Hell in a Cell match. And Dominic Mysterio came out in the paddy wagon in, entrance to, to wrestle his dad. I was actually covering WrestleMania on behalf of, uh, the, the d -Loop podcast and Believe Network. For Mania Week, and that was one of the coolest experience ever to represent yeah. the brand, represent the, the network, but then also finding out that you were there too as as a yeah. fan in, in the crowd. It was awesome. <laughs> it was it was, I was it was totally it was there. yeah. I I had it was it was a total blast. As a matter of fact, the co-host of the Dilu podcast when I'm covering wrestling, Gabby, I met her at LAX the day I was leaving to go home. We didn't know each other. Oh, and wow. she saw me with my WrestleMania hoodie on and we both looked at each other and we was like, oh, we got to talk. And next thing you know, here we are a year and a half later. And uh, yeah, and we're, she's my co-host for the show when we're covering wrestling and we're doing all those other things. So it's, it was, it was one of the most life-changing experiences going to LA for those five days I was out there. 
That is so cool. I had a feeling I was like, yeah, because that that was the first time I think I've ever seen him in Hollywood, too. So that was a huge. And then I not mention um, the convention center the day before I also went to. And I saw all the amazing costumes. Eddie Guerrero had like a beautiful memorial. The low, like, yeah, the low rider. The yeah. Low riders. And oh my God, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Then they had like undertakers, like gears. And yeah. Oh my gosh. It was, it was amazing. So many people there. Oh my gosh. There were so many people. Was... I do know that Trish Stratus was around the area signing. I didn't get to see her, but she is my all-time favorite diva. Okay. And that would have been so cool if I ran into Trish Stratus, but you know what? It's all good. Like it is what it is. So, and you already know John Cena all the way for me, chain gang. Yeah. And he just announced his retirement um, at money in the bank on uh Saturday night in 2025 is going to be the farewell, the farewell tour for John Cena. So I'll never forget the day he debuted. I'll never forget that day. He just came out on SmackDown out of nowhere. It was basic thugonomics playing in the background. You see this guy comes out with these jean shorts. And my sister and I would just stop, look at each other like, who is this? And then as soon as it said Boston, Massachusetts, we were just like, we were so happy. (laughs) Because we didn't have anybody representing Massachusetts at the time, you know, while we were watching it. So that was huge, huge game changer for me. Like huge game changer. Never yeah, forget. John. It John is. I mean, he's yeah. he carried the company for two decades, oh and you know now he's doing he's incredible true. things in Hollywood for sure. Oh yeah, he's he's. I never. He's a great actor, actually. Yeah. Actually, I enjoyed him in Trainwreck. That was now that was some funny stuff with uh, Amy Schumer. That was hilarious. Yeah. yeah, I was actually watching him on the the Suicide uh, Squad movie the other day. Oh, that's right. He wasn't that. Yeah, he was. He did good in that too. I was watching him the other day. I was like, "Oh shoot!" <laughs> well, Kenny, where can the people find you on social media? Yes. Tell them where to find and where they can listen to your music. Oh my gosh! Well, I'm on every platform you can think of. Okay, mm, just kidding. Um, uh, but Instagram for sure, Kenny Monroe Music, K E T T I E M U N R O E Music for sure. Um, same thing, um, for my TikTok, but you don't have to add the music. It's just Ketty Monroe. If you want to make it easier, you can always just Google Ketty Monroe, um, K-E-T-T-I-E-M-U-N-R-O-E and all of the stuff that you'll find from interviews to blogs, articles, podcasts, uh, music videos, all of that stuff you'll find online, SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, Apple, Tidal, Deezer, you name it. Um, and you know, once in a while I might run into me on the Hollywood Boulevard doing a little shopping. So don't be a stranger. Say hi. I don't bite. <laughs> well, Ketty, yeah. um, again, thank you so much, you know, thank you for so much for having me. No, this 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 really means the world. And like I said, you know, when we I, I think we we met about a couple years ago and um we we said we were gonna do this, and I'm glad we were able to yeah. do it. And I look forward to, you know, maybe a collaboration at some point. I would love to do basically and everything. So be on the lookout for that, ladies and gentlemen, because that will be a game changer for sure. All right. All right, Derek.